I am Sahiti Sarva, and I want to talk to you about what happens when women make headlines. So this is something my colleague and I have been working on for a while now. But before coming in here today, I was like, okay, what has been happening with women for the last month? Because I took a break from it after this project. Uh, I went back to my usual sources of Indian news, and I was like, okay, what's happening in India? Delhi man shoots girlfriend dead. Bhopal man killed his mother. Woman travels from Hyderabad meets lover, and she's battered to death, and so on. And by the time I was at 21st November, I said, I'm I'm looking for positive news. Let me let me um, you know spoil this data venture and look for positive news. But what we did after that is what I want to talk to you about. I'm Sahiti. That's my colleague Leonardo. This is a passion project, so our day jobs are completely different. But before we did any of this, we were friends who came together and said, "Okay, we want to learn how to use language data, and we want to do something about gender. We want to pick a topic in gender." And it was a project that started in grad school because both of us really wanted to do something with it. And thanks to the pudding, uh, who managed to you know say yes to publishers, we actually went ahead and expanded this one-year study to something fifteen years. So today I want to talk to you about what did we do and what did we learn. What did we do? So this is a bunch of headlines that you see, which you know in one month all of us managed to read. But what else is it saying? It's also saying that the first X headlines are all about violence, but only the last two are slightly empowering. But what if we do this for more than just one month of headlines for more than just one country? So we picked up four countries: the UK, USA, India, and South Africa. We picked the top 50 publications from each of these places because they're English-speaking languages. Uh, and for the last 16 years, from 2005 to 2021, we looked up all the headlines with the keyword tag with women, women, lady, all of the words synonymous with it, and we ended up with 382,139 English headlines. Small data set, <laughs> I think so. Uh, and then we did some simple stack bar charts. We found that the first most commonly used word across all countries is "man." Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. And then we went ahead and did some bubble charts, and we saw that actually, if we calculate the bias behind each of these headlines, which I'll go into in a little bit, we see that the Daily Mail is a lot more biased than, say, the BBC. And we can categorize all of these top 50 publications across this index called the bias index. And then we plotted some area charts. We saw that some words were used less over time, some words were used more. But the funny thing, or the dramatic thing, was that there's a constant source of drama, and that the frequency of these words did not really change over the last 16 years. But what did we learn through all of these things? So the first aha moment came when we did all of these beautiful area charts and stack bar charts and scrolly telling. And then I sit down to start writing my uh, piece, and I say sensationalism has been on the rise. And my editor comes back and says, "Do you know this? Do you know that sensationalism is on the rise?" And I said, "You know what? Fair point. You caught me on that." So I went back and I was like, "I'm sure there is a source out there that tells me that sensationalism is on the rise." If I call ten people on the road today saying, "Are you reading more spiced up news headlines?" They'll probably say yes, but no, there wasn't. So the simplest of charts that we made was, in fact, a line chart, mostly because it it fills an information gap. This became one of our top highlights that we actually put out in pages because we see that actually, when women do make headlines, it is more sensational than other news. And what what else? The sensationalism has actually been on the rise for any kind of news over the last 15 years. This was a simple analysis, but somehow this is the first time it's been done on 300,000 headlines. What else? What was the other aha moment we had? This was a project where we both were data nerds, and we said, "Okay, we need to also brush up on our data skills. So let's learn how to automate this 300,000 uh, headlines that we have." But what we realized is that automation is a lot of manual work, where you're coding in context. You're coding the context in which you are operating in your problem statement. A lot of algorithms that we use today. Have uh, a set of words that they start to use to identify sentiment, that identify bias, and so on and so forth. And one such bag of words that's available in almost every NLP package that you would use on Python is something called stop words. Stop words are words that are so commonly used they carry very little useful information. Useful, 
for example, in these headlines, you can see after and with, for, that, don't carry that much information. But hey, P.T. Usha becomes first woman president. First is useless out of context, but extraordinarily useful in the context of women. Imagine if we left out the word first from the analysis of this headline. You would miss the first defense minister, the first prime minister, the first person of color who took the stage today, all of these things that are news head, newsworthy. Then we went back and actually looked at the stop word because this is something that's coded in the package. Usually, usually you just you know, start writing code using an existing package without questioning how that package was built. We went and removed the word first and said, hey, it's not a stop word in our context. And this is definitely my favorite insight of the entire project. The word first is the second most commonly used word across three out of the four countries. Over the last few years, women have been shattering glass, glass ceilings, and here we are hiding the word first inside a package. Um, and then we went on to code in more context. We started to tag words as violent or empowering or gender to see how many more gendered headlines do we have than we have empowering headlines, than we have violent headlines. We found that there are two times more violent headlines than empowering ones, and that is not very surprising. But when we started to analyze headlines, each headline has a lot of impact. Why is it important? Right? The context behind this is that even feminism became a lot more popular because of the headline. In, I think, 1968, there was a New York Times article that says, Here's the second wave of feminism, which actually went in to study gender bias and the relationship between gender and language. The second wave, or the, using the metaphor of wave, happened because of that one headline. That means these headlines have a lot of power in the way we think of metaphors, the way we think of people in our society. And one of the things that, in, in the part of adding context, was that we identified gendered language. What happens when you use gender language Typically, gender in language hides or makes a woman invisible or heightens the gender when there is no need to be. If you write a policy statement that says, if he is doing X, Y, Z, and completely remove the she, you are making the woman invisible. But if you are specifying that's a congresswoman, an actress, and not an actor, you are unnecessarily emphasizing the gender of that person when it has no place to be there. And so we went on to find all of those words words like actress, daughter, wife, mother. And then we went on to find words like emotional and support and care that are typically tagged along with feminine or they're categorized as feminine. A lot of manual work behind this automation. And then we found that some headlines are more biased than others. For example, when you say daughter an emotional meeting with women given life back by selfless courage of her dead mother, selfless courage is quite feminine. And that brings me to my last aha moment. Embrace the contradictions. I think the, the biggest lesson we learned from this is that the story of when women make headlines is full of contradictions. It shows that there was an increase in em empowering words over the last 10 years. But we also see that a lot of headlines continue to remain biased. But the bigger contradiction is in the choice of the problem statement itself. We went on to say that words are a reflection of a society. Virginia Woolf, for example, would completely agree with me because she said since words survive the chops and changes of time longer than any other substance, therefore they are the truest. So actually studying the words we use when women make headlines is a true reflection of society. But I am from India, so all of the Eastern culture tells me that words can really only approximate. It's not a headline you're talking about, it's somebody's life or a family. And all of those nuances are never going to be captured in that one single headline. So are we really getting closer to the truth if we are analyzing these headlines? Well, I don't know. But I am here to keep trying. And I think I'll take the last minute that I have to say the last contradiction we had was to leave countries like India and South Africa out of these projects because it's so difficult to get data for them. But I think that is one we chose to stick with and thank God for that because a project like this opens a lot more projects and answer, opens a lot more questions than it ever answers. So I hope um, and that's a contradiction everybody here also is willing to embrace. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity.